morning. Welcome to St. Luke's Worship. I am so glad that you are worshiping with us today. I'm Katie Montgomery Mears, and I'm one of the pastors on staff here at St. Luke's. So at St. Luke's, our mission is to help you live and love like Jesus, to make us all more deeply devoted followers of Jesus. And so it is my prayer that this service today, all of the music and the message and the scripture will help lift us all up and bring us closer to Jesus. As Ashley mentioned earlier, we hope that you will check in and let us know that you're here. So if you have the St. Luke's app, we hope you'll check in on the app. And um, if you are watching on the website, you can just click the connect button that is right above my head. So today is a really special day. It is Senior Sunday. This is the day that we celebrate all of our graduating seniors. As we know, these past few months have been anything but normal, and that means a really different year than a lot of our seniors envisioned and a different end of the year. But we think that um, what they have done by graduating is really awesome, and we are super proud of them. And so we want to celebrate them in this worship service today. Some of these seniors have grown up here at St. Luke's, and they have been formed through children's ministries and student ministries. Some of the seniors have just joined us in the past couple of years or the past year, um, and yet they have still been deeply formed by all of the ministries here and by many of you. So today we are going to hear a testimony from a senior. We're going to be led in prayer by a senior, and another senior will offer us the benediction at the end of the service today. I hope you'll join me in prayer for all of these seniors in the coming months as they transition into their next steps. Hello, my name is Alexandra Blake and I've just graduated, if you can call it that, from the Kincaid School. This fall, I will be attending Washington University in St. Louis and running cross country and track. And I'm super excited for what the future holds, but I wanted to share just a little bit about how my time at St. Luke's has shaped me into the person I am today and given me resources and relationships that will last long after high school is over. To start off, I want to share a quite a short, quite embarrassing story. It's a Wednesday evening in the fall, and us senior girls are having our weekly small group at Lauren Faust's house. Her mom made us pasta for dinner, and as I returned for seconds, I notice a plastic cup full of watery yellow liquid on the stovetop. I ask if this is the pasta water, and from the table where she is sitting, Lara says something along the lines of, no, that's the lemonade. Now I'm skeptical and sensing this is a prank, so I point out that the cup is warm, but other members of the small group begin to chip in with details like, oh, that's the seasonal fall drink that the Fausts make. It's like cider. It's called lemon ale. You've never heard of it? You should try it. Not wanting to make a fool of myself, but not wanting to offend the Faust family by rejecting their special brew, I hold the cup in my hands, but still hesitate to drink it. Then, Lauren Faust takes a sip and nods, explaining how good it is. Now, Lauren is known for her humor, so I'm not ready to cave yet. But then, Marissa, who I have not known to lie or play along with elaborate schemes, swoops in, takes a generous drink, and agrees with a perfectly straight face that it's really good. Now, I'm thinking Marissa is too kind and prone to honesty to lie to me, so I shrug and lift the cup to my lips. At this point, the whole small group is watching the scene unfold. As soon as my lips touch the liquid and I realize that this is, in fact, pasta water, just the excess liquid from the delicious pasta we ate, everyone bursts out laughing, myself included. Needless to say, we had a lovely Bible study after dinner. I tell this story because it's just one of hundreds of precious moments and memories from my time at St. Luke's that I treasure. The relationships I have formed and the community I have been part of in the youth group are set apart from others in my life because they are centered around Jesus. To love and serve the Lord first and together allows us to know and love each other more fully. It's beautiful and it's scary, and I feel so blessed to be in a relationship with these people who I now cannot imagine my life without. From week after week of small group time, I've deepened my relationships with the other senior girls that I get to call some of my best friends, and I've learned more about Jesus thanks to my incredible small group leaders. Shout out to Colby and Rachel. The staff in student ministries has welcomed my questions, lent me books and devotionals to read to deepen my understanding, and challenged me to take leadership roles even when I was hesitant. From Sunday school, the story, retreats, mission trips, and just Sunday lunches, I have learned so much about the Bible and about Jesus. But more importantly, I have seen what it looks like to live out an active faith. My adult leaders and peers have been active examples in my life of what it means to live and walk with Jesus. I am so grateful for all the people who have no obligation to invest in my life and the lives of other students, yet have poured into us and nurtured us. How dare I try to live selfishly and not give back to people and kids all the love and wisdom that has been given freely to me. 
I want to pay forward the selfless love shown to me by the leaders and the fiery faith of my peers, and even the younger students that, who mentor me almost as much as I mentor them. I want to be a small group leader and volunteer with youth groups, even if it means long, sleepless weekend retreats and frustrating Bible studies where everyone wants to talk at the same time until we're taking volunteers to say the closing prayer. All this to say, I would not be the person I am today without the grace of God and my time at St. Luke's. And to my small group, I can't wait to watch you thrive in college, grow in your careers, get married, and one day when we're old, hopefully we will still laugh at memories like the pasta water night. Thank you. 50 days after the Passover, the Jewish people celebrated the Feast of Weeks, and it was also called Pentecost. And so as all of the disciples were gathered together after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection to celebrate Pentecost, uh, they were gathered together in one room. When a wind blew in and the Holy Spirit landed on each of their heads as if a tongue of fire, and they all began to speak in different languages. And after that, they went out, and people were really confused about it. Some people thought that they were drunk, but Peter said, it is the Holy Spirit. And he began to preach about Jesus and about the gospel message, and 3,000 people were baptized that day. This is the origin of the Christian church. That was the first church. And so we celebrate that today on Pentecost. Later in the service, when we say the Lord's Prayer We will be led by members of our congregation who will be saying the Lord's Prayer in their native tongues or in other languages. And so we hope that you will say the Lord's Prayer in whatever language is most comfortable for you. But as you listen and you hear the prayer said in multiple languages, we hope that that will just wash over you and bring you joy as you imagine what all of God's kingdom looks like. All of the different folks speaking different languages coming together with one prayer. Today's scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 and verses 42 through 47. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. God, our Creator, earth has many languages, but your gospel proclaims your love to all nations in one heavenly tongue. We praise you for your constant, unconditional love. We give you thanks for the many dedicated teachers, leaders, and parents who have brought us to this time in our lives. We thank you that they have lived out the promises made at our baptism, proclaiming the good news and living Christ-like for us surrounding us with a community of love and forgiveness through your holy spirit may we continue to grow in our service to others always being and becoming true disciples who walk in your ways forgive us when we are so arrogant as to think we have succeeded on our own forgive us when we take your many blessings for granted or as act as though we deserve them help us to receive your blessings and share them generously as you have asked us to share with them We ask you to open our eyes, our ears, our hearts to the moving of the Holy Spirit among us so that we will work together to be the church you are calling us to be. We offer this prayer in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. This is the time in our service in which we make an offering to God. 
We remember that worship is not about what we receive, but it is about what we offer, what we give, how we give of ourselves, our whole lives, our offerings to God. And so we hope that you will continue to make gifts as you are able to be generous with St. Luke's as we continue to serve those in our community around us and all of our neighbors. As always, if you need anything, we hope that you will reach out to St. Luke's and let us know how you're doing, if we can be praying for you. If you'd like to make a gift, you can text the number on the screen, or if you're watching on our website, you can click the Give button that's above my head. Before I begin to preach today, I know most of you have seen the video of uh, the death of George Floyd and have been following the protests in response to that. And it just feels like we need to have a time of prayer as a congregation about, about that. So would you join me in a time of prayer? O oh God of peace and of justice, our hearts are hurting as we watch the news and we struggle to find the right words to pray as there is so much pain. We pray first and foremost for George Floyd and for his family. He was your child and we pray and hope that you hold him in your hand right now. God, as we watch the anger burst forth in the streets around us, we are reminded that Jesus used a whip to turn the tables over in the temple and at the same time taught his disciples to be peacemakers and told his disciple in the Garden of Gethsemane to put away his sword. We pray that the violence we see would be replaced by real solutions and changes in both hearts and actions. We pray that somehow we all would recognize and change any system that treats people differently, intentionally or unintentionally, simply because of the color of their skin. God, because we seek to live and love like Jesus, we pray also for Derek Chauvin and for the other officers involved, for they too are your children, no matter what. And we thank you for the law enforcement officers who serve us and protect us. Grant them wisdom and discernment to make the difficult decisions they must make each day. And most of all, God, show each one of us what we can do so that justice rolls down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So God, as we consider your word today, open us up. Open our eyes that we might see and our ears that we might hear your word in the midst of these words and we might hear the cry of the needy. Open our hearts that we might feel and then, O oh Lord, open our hands that we might serve. Amen. A few years ago, uh, my wife Dee and I took a class in uh, CPR and uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And, you know, they bring that, um, that dummy over to you, that CPR dummy. And what seems like it would be just really easy is not as easy as it looks. You know, they teach you how to do the compressions, how to find the right spot or the, right there at the sternum. And then uh, they, they teach you to, to do the, um, the breaths until you can see the, the chest rise. And it isn't always... Um, as easy as it looks. You know, in the movies, when, when someone uh, like is, has, is drowned and they bring them back on the shore and they lay them down and they beat on them and then they blow into their mouth and then they sputter <coughs> and, and they come back to life. That's the picture I want you to keep in your mind today. This picture of, of, of a body that seems to be sort of lifeless, lying there and, and all of a sudden uh, coming to life as the breath is breathed into, into it. You see, um, the, the early church in Acts 2, what we see is not this vibrant uh, church. So as Acts 2 begins, what we see is, is not the body of Christ, which the church is supposed to be. What you see is these disciples just hunkered down in a room and they've been praying um, they've been, you know, it's not like they haven't done anything at all, but, but there's this spirit of kind of grief and fear that just has them bound. And, and, and then 
on the day of Pentecost, right, which is a, a Jewish feast celebrating the gift of the law, the, there is this wind that comes and they see flames on their head. And you see this incredible transformation in the disciples and not just them, but, but everyone who's gathered there. And, and we see this, this church come to life. It's, it's like it, it sputters and coughs and then it's up. You know, the, uh, the word for spirit for, that is used in Holy Spirit in both Hebrew and in Greek is the same word as the word for breath, right? It's ruah in Hebrew and pneuma in, in uh, Greek. And it is, it is the breath of God. The Holy Spirit is that, that breath of God that that brings the church to life. We often think about what the Holy Spirit does in each one of our lives when we say, well, we receive the Holy Spirit or we were filled with the Holy Spirit and the transformation, the fruit of the Spirit that comes uh, from the Spirit being active in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, those fruit of the Spirit that manifest themselves in each one of us individually. But today I want to look at something a little different. You see, Pentecost is the birthday of the church. It is the day that the church became the body of Christ, the living body of Christ. And I want us to see, to move from the beginning of Acts 2 to the end of Acts 2, to see what the Holy Spirit does um, in the life of the church, the, what, what it creates in the life of the church. And I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Um, and we're gonna just sort of jump right in to, into uh, the scripture together. Uh, so if you're following along in your Bible, it's, we wanna begin with verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. The Holy Spirit breathes into the church a devotion to learning and living the faith. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to the prayers, a, de a devotion. And I was on an airplane once flying back from Dallas, and I ended up sitting next to a guy who was older than I, and he had on this Rolling Stones t-shirt. And, and on his arm was the Rolling Stones logo. You know, the lips with the tongue were right there on his arm. And I said, uh, you must be a Rolling Stones fan. And he said, yeah, ever since their first concert in the United States, uh, I've been going to their concerts. And my goal is to have gone to 100 concerts. So I've been to the one in Dallas, and there was one coming up in Houston uh, tomorrow night, and I'm going to be there for that one too. And at first I thought, you know, there's probably something else important you could be doing with your life than just chasing around the Rolling Stones concerts. But then I began to just think, you know, that's devotion, that is a, 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 a sense of commitment to something. I love the word devotion because it ties together two concepts. It ties together um, love, right, and it, uh, an adoration, and also a discipline. To be devoted to something means there's a certain uh, discipline to that. I wonder, it got me to thinking about, uh, about our discipline. You know, I, um, I look and wonder how, how, how many times, maybe I'll have you do this. How many times have you looked over and seen your Bible with dust on it? You haven't looked at it in quite some time. Or when was the last time you had a, a significant prayer time with God? Not just like about one single thing, like, oh, I got to pray about that. But not just like for meals, or, but to really devote yourself to a, a time of prayer with God. Well, maybe you can look at your, your worship attendance and ask yourself, does, when I look at, at, at how many weeks I miss, does that mean I have a devotion? I heard a pastor not too long ago um, he was talking about a visit he went on to Africa. and He'd been asked to preach in Africa. And when he got there, he, they told him that people were going to be walking two days to hear him preach. 
and he, he was sleeping in a guest house next to kind of a sanctuary. And he said he woke up at five o'clock in the morning and he could hear them singing hymns in the sanctuary, just the, antiphonally, hearing the, the men sing first and then the women sing and then the men and then the women and then joining together and these loud voices at five o'clock in the morning. And um, he said it, it just made him realize that, that these people were devoted. Like we, get, we, we might say, I'm devoted to my work, I'm devoted to my family. But underneath all of those things, the foundation of all of those things needs to be, or the Holy Spirit inspires in us, a devotion to living, to learning and living the faith. Okay, goes on. Now, lest you think that the, that the disciples were so heavenly minded that they were of no earthly good, you've heard that saying before, the scripture says, awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. They made a difference. The, the Holy Spirit breathed into uh, the disciples uh, the desire, the ability to address the pain of the world. Look, let's make no mistake. Pe people came to Jesus partly because of his incredible preaching, because he just commanded a sense of authority. But they came to him because they were sick. They came to, them because, came to him because they were lepers and needed to be cleansed. They came to him uh, because they were possessed by demons. Right? They were dealing with, with issues that were, that were life-altering in their lives, and they thought, this one can really actually help me. Well, look, uh, the Holy Spirit breathes into us that uh, um, willingness and ability and authority to address the pain we see in the world around us. We, we live in a world that's filled with people who are hurting, whether, whether it's disease, COVID, or cancer, or whether it's poverty, or whether it's racism, or all of the things that we're surrounded by, lack of education, lack of all sorts of resources. And, and what the whole, when, when the Holy Spirit fills a community, that community has this, this desire to address the issues of, the, of pain in the world around us. I've been reading a book by uh, Jacqueline Novogratz. Um, the book is called Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. 30 years ago, she went into Rwanda. She was a banker, and she'd been working for a capital uh, investment company. And she went in and set up um, a bank to do microfinancing for the people that were there to, to help them develop their economy and to make a difference in the lives of these, these poor people who um, needed to make their lives better. Uh, and I, I just want to read to you what she says, because it really spoke to me. Uh, she said that she had, had been listening to Steve jo Jobs speak, and that he spoke of a technological revolution that was coming, and that, that the world needed this technological revolution to, to uh, change the world. Here, here's what uh, she writes. What we need is a moral revolution, one that helps us reimagine and reform technology, business, and politics, thereby touching all aspects of our lives. By moral, I don't mean strictly adhering to established rules of authority or convention, regardless of consequence. I mean a set of principles focused on elevating our individual and collective dignity, a daily choice to serve others, not simply benefit ourselves. Now I differ from her because she says that this moral revolution cannot come from above. I think it will come from above. I think the Holy Spirit will, will fill the church, fill a community of faith to say it, it's time for us to take over the hearts of men and women and uh, let them use the tools that the world has that God has given us 
to make the world better for other people. To our seniors today, I, I um, you know, I can't, I can't imagine the great things you're going to do. You know, businesses started and families built and, and all sorts of things that are going to be just really great. But I hope there's also at the core of them something good. I do believe that the Spirit will lead you to lead us in a moral revolution. A time in which we see the evils of the world around us and God uses us to to do wonders and signs to grow the kingdom. I will so excitedly not just watch that happen with your leadership, but I'll jump aboard. Okay, wonders and signs to address the pain in the world around us. Then it goes on. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. So the Holy Spirit breathes into, um, breathes into the church this in- incredible and amazing generosity. They sold their goods, distributed to any had need. Here's what it does not say. It does not say they sold their goods and distributed to anybody they liked. It does not say they sold their goods and distributed the proceeds to anyone who deserved it. What they say is to all who had need, all. Uh, it's uh, one of my favorite stories is about um, a golfer. His, uh, um, his name is Roberto de Vicenzo. So uh, he just passed away a few years ago. Um, but in 1968, he um, technically didn't win, but he won the Masters at Augusta. The problem was that year, he, that w- when the round was finished, he signed an incorrect scorecard. So what happens when you play golf is your, par- your playing partner and you both keep a scorecard for, for one another's uh, card uh, scores as well. And when, when his playing partner gave him a four instead of a three on one particular hole, and he didn't look at it and he just signed it. So, so his partner had signed him for a 67 and he had a 66. And so by the rules of golf, he was given a 67. Otherwise he would have tied for the lead and gone into a playoff. That's funny, that's, uh, that's the story they remember about in 1968, but um, just three weeks later, uh, here at the Houston Open, he won. He won the Houston Open. And uh, after, he was, after it was done, um, a woman met him in the parking lot, and she told him that, um, that her daughter had leukemia. She had a baby that had leukemia and that she was poor and needed money to see if uh, they could get a treatment for this dying baby. And so he gave her hundreds of dollars. And um, after he went back inside, uh, the police officer, the guard came and said, did you give that lady money? And he said, yes, she has a baby who's dying. And he said, you know, that lady didn't have a baby who's dying. Uh, You've been been conned. She's always over here hustling and uh, we try and run her out of here, but uh, you've been conned. And uh, DeFenzo said, there's not a baby who's dying? That's the best news I have ever heard. I, I just think about, you see, generosity isn't just that I'm gonna give money away. Generosity has to do with your spirit. You know, do you have this spirit of judgmentalism and um, uh, sort of narrow-mindedness? To be generous, to be, to be big-spirited is to be uh, willing to give ourselves away. This congregation has been so generous. I believe the Holy Spirit has inspired generosity. And there is not a time, I've been here 14 years now, and there's not a time when there's been a need that the congregation didn't just generously give. And that's that's happening right now. But friends, it, it, it shouldn't just be about St. Luke's. It's about so many other people right now, right? There are businesses that are struggling and we need to be generous 
the church needs to, to lead the way in being generous to help support those, those businesses. People are trying to just make it, make it uh, feed their families. And there are, there are so many nonprofits who don't have the same kind of constituency that we have, that uh, the same sense of ownership that, that we have and are, are needing support from the people all around. But when the Holy Spirit comes into the church, it inspires an amazing generosity. And it goes on, day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread in their homes and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. The Holy Spirit breathes into the church a life with others. You can't be a solitary, spirit-led Christian. All right, the word that's here for fellowship is the word koinonia. And uh, it, it's a word that, it's used twice in this passage. Um, the, it's, a, it's a word that means not just like, you know, slapping on the back and shaking hands and, you know, drinking punch and cookies. Koinonia means life together, to, to be a part of something, to be a part of, of a community. It's, it's, to go, it's to be united in a way that is deeper than opinions, right? You can have multiple opinions, it's a way that is uh, to be deeper than demographics, deeper than socioeconomics, deeper than personalities. We're bonded together because we drink from the same well of life. Right? That's what it means to be community. To, to seek the good of, of the others of which you're a part, to see them as a we and not as a they. That can be hard sometimes, but it is what the Holy Spirit does. There is a, a, a concept uh, that came out of the Society of Jesus, really, the Jesuits, and they call it accompaniment. Accompaniment, you know, like a piano accompanies you while you sing. Accompaniment means to go alongside, to come along with. That, that, that to be in accompaniment means I'm going to live life with you. And they speak of, of accompaniment with the poor, accompaniment with the marginalized, accompaniment with the sick. We accompany one another. That's what it means to be in community. And when the Holy Spirit comes, the, the, the uh, energy, the pull is not away from one another, not towards individualization, not towards look what God is doing in me, but look what God's doing in us because we live life together. Then it closes. Here's the last thing. Praising God and having goodwill of all the people and day by day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The Holy Spirit breathes into the church a contagious witness for the faith. So, so let me ask you this. Why do you think that, that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved? Well, it was because of, of what Peter and James and the other uh, disciples were doing there in Jerusalem. Because of their witness. Because of the power of this community. This, in Acts 4 says that they, they told them, please quit talking. Please just quit, quit sharing and quit witnessing. And Acts 4 says uh, that uh, that Peter and the others responded, but we cannot stop speaking of what we ourselves have seen and heard. <laughs> have you ever noticed, I don't know if you noticed when you were reading this, I, I, I wonder if it jumped out at you, <clears throat> how these pieces, these sort of components of the early church match um, in many ways our inside out habits are five inside-out habits, right? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. <clears throat> we pray and worship. We study the Bible, right? Signs and wonders were done by the apostles. We give ourselves away in service. In incredible generosity, right? They sold their give, goods and gave the, the proceeds to all. Well, we give ourselves away in generosity, 
they, uh, they had all things together. They, uh, day by day, they met in the temple, shared their food with glad and generous hearts. We make friends. And then this last one, we tell our stories. Day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Uh, have you ever seen the, um, the play Hamilton? Uh, I hope you get the chance someday. I hear it's coming on uh, television, Disney Plus. The stage version is going to be broadcast for so many people who weren't, haven't been able to see it. But near the end, um, and sort of throughout the, the musical, there is a song that comes that says, Who lives, who dies, who tells your story? And as I was listening to it, I kept thinking about Jesus. That as he's going through all of this suffering and all of these challenges, wondering who, who tells his story. In Hamilton, Eliza says she ultimately uh, tells his story and lives for 50 years and starts an orphanage and all sorts of great things to sort of honor him. I wonder if Jesus was thinking, who's going to tell my story? Well, I'm going to tell you, the Holy Spirit is to inspire in us the ability to tell that story, to tell the story of Jesus and how Jesus has impacted our lives. Next week, next Sunday, we begin a new sermon series called The Story of God and Us. And uh, what we're hoping to do is over the summer, we're going to look at all of the pieces of, of, of the sort of the scriptural story. The Bible is not just a bunch of little sort of unconnected pieces, but it's a narrative of what God has been doing in a relationship with us. It's a narrative that's full of brokenness and then reconciliation of incredible high points and some really terrible low points and this persistent God who won't give up on us and won't give up on us and won't give up on the world. I want you to be able to tell that story, that magnificent story, so, so that in fact everyone might know. All right, friends, um, we are still celebrating the 75th anniversary, 75th birthday of St. Luke's. And uh, it's a little more challenging now with our COVID-19, but we're going we're gonna to get, get to, to do that one way or another. We're going to party one way or another to celebrate that birthday. But I know for sure that on a November day in 1945, in the high school of Lamar Auditorium, the Holy Spirit came and breathed into a group of people, this church, the breath of life. And it may have sputtered and, uh, and coughed, but, it, the, but she came up swinging, St. Luke's did. And for 75 years, the Holy Spirit has continued to to breathe into the people in this place the breath of life. And I am absolutely convinced that the Holy Spirit's not going to stop. Let's pray together. Oh, most gracious God, we thank you for all you've done in the church universal and even for all you've done by breathing your Holy Spirit into St. Luke's. And we pray, God, on this Pentecost Sunday that a fresh wind, a fresh breath of your spirit would fill us again. That indeed, we might become not just a gathering of disciples, but your body, your living, breathing body, accomplishing your work in the world. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.